To somebody who takes scripture so seriously, which you guys obviously do, and you've committed your life to this, that has to, at some deep level, be painful. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it, it really is. Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 70, translating the revised English version with guests John Shaneheit and Johnny Barnes. I'm Mark Kane. Okay, if you're like me, there's a list of things that you can imagine yourself doing if only you had the right set of talents or infinite time to hone the skill. I love physics, and I love the satisfying application of physics in billiards. Pool. Visualize and calculate the trajectory. Steady control. The cue makes contact. And then your highly formulaic angular transfer of momentum plays out right before your eyes with the gratifying plop at the end. <laughs> but I'll never be a pool master. Or, or to lean into a cello and coax it to sing a powerful and gripping melody of deep emotion. <sighs> well, the learning curve is way outside my scope. Or to wake up each day and dedicate time discerning the meaning of ancient texts of scripture, but not just for my own study but for the benefit of others. Alas, I'm a bit past that point in my life where a deep knowledge of Greek or Hebrew is achievable. <laughs> I just have to take a deep breath and appreciate what I can do, and then appreciate those around me who have been blessed with a different path in life. Today it's like that for me. This team and their years and years of work, it's fascinating to me. There's a good chance that you are like me, and translating ancient Greek and Hebrew is not exactly listed at the top of your resume. So you and I, we can enjoy this together. It's a glimpse into the life and work of a very, very niche type of effort. And if you wondered why someone might want to produce yet another translation of the Bible, when we have so many qualified Trinitarians already blessing us with their entirely unbiased translation choices. Careful, Mark. <sighs> Maybe today you'll wonder no longer. Johnny and John, I'm excited to have you today to talk about your work with the REV translation and just, you know, living the life of a translator. The glamorous and exciting life, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Several people who listen to this also listen to the Trinity's podcast, and they're like, is that Johnny Barnes that I heard in episodes 356 and 357 with Dale Tuggy? And it is. It is, yeah. I don't want to rehash that whole story, but I want to know how, after you had changed your theology and started to find out about all these people out here, how you ended up connected with Spirit and Truth in the translation. Yeah, so... When I was originally digging into the Trinity versus Unitarian idea, uh, I had reached out to Jerry, Jerry Weirwill, yeah. who works with me very closely now. And you know, we work every day together with John doing the New Testament mainly. I had reached out to him and was like, hey, you know, how do you deal with John 1? How do you deal with Colossians 1? <laughs> uh, you know, it wasn't really even his like genius responses. He was like, honestly, those are pretty tough passages. Like, these are my responses, but you know, they are tough. I'm not going to beat around the bush. It was really shocking to me because I feel like from the other side, I had always heard like, here's my understanding. Everybody else is wrong. <laughs> it was kind of the humility with which Jerry approached it that actually got me interested. Mm. And I was like, oh, he's not like trying to force this on me at all. He's just saying, oh yeah, this is, you know, how I understand it. After a few years of looking into it, I ended up calling him back and was like, hey, I actually became a Unitarian. And he's like, really? And I was like, yep. <laughs> then he said, you've, you've taken some Greek, right, at DTS? And I was like, yeah, I've taken quite a bit of it. I feel a lot more confident in it than Hebrew. And he was like, oh, you know, we actually need somebody to help us translate the New Testament. So that's kind of how it all happened. Okay. For those who didn't hear the podcast with Dale, DTS is Dallas Theological Seminary. The title of that episode, Seminary student takes Trinity class, becomes Unitarian. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a clickbaity title. It is. But. So, John, how did you meet and incorporate Johnny into your work? Well, <laughs> that was actually fairly simple. Jerry introduced us. 
So we did need some extra help on the translating team. And it worked out really well because Johnny was still in school, so he could only come on board part-time anyway. So it really gave him a chance to get to meet us, and it gave us a chance to meet him and to work with him. Mm. And when he got out of school and was available full-time, then we said, yeah, let's put Johnny on the team. And we were blessed to be able to do that. (laughs) That's great. Well, John, let's go back in time and introduce you and how this translation came to be in the first place. And you can start wherever you like. (laughs) I know exactly how the translation started because I was raised atheist. But in any case, I ended up in college and got born again. And uh, I didn't get born again because I was raised Christian. I didn't get born again because I had all these Christian friends that won me over. I got born again because I was convinced the Bible was true. Hmm. And so from very early on with my very first Bible, I'm making changes, making marks because we were using the King James Version. Mm. And I occasionally would have somebody look at my Bible and say, gosh, you've got more Bible in the margin of your Bible than you have Bible. (laughs) And then in the year 2000, we started running classes for teenagers. And I would get in front of these teenagers and I would, of course, they're not to say that they weren't very excited about reading is an understatement. (laughs) So it was like (laughs) pulling teeth to get them to read the Bible. And and I would say, you guys have got to read your Bible. And then, you know, the extra step, you've got to read your Bible and believe it. But then when we would get in class, it would be like, well, this isn't this and this word isn't really that. And this word needs to be modified. (laughs) And somebody came to me and said, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't tell them to read their Bible and believe it. And then they, you know, you're telling them not to believe these certain words. And you may know that, but they don't. Mm. They suggested that we, I do my my own Bible or we do at that time. It was Christian educational services. I was thinking, oh my gosh, the world already calls us a cult. You know, what will happen if we have our own Bible? Yeah. But through teaching the teenagers that year, I became convinced that No, we really need our own version of the Bible that gets some of those, I used to call them firestorm verses, the verses like Romans 8, 28, because, you know, the standard translation, all things work together for those who love God. Well, they don't. And even the New International Version doesn't translate it that way. A more proper translation, and this is right in the NIV, is in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Mm. And so if you can get some of the firestorm verses translated correctly, then it really helps people enter into a relationship with God. And then, of course, you know, the biblical Unitarianism, the, mm. been getting the Trinity verses straightened out, like John 1.1, 1, 1, John 8.58, that kind of thing. And then as time went on, because when I first started this, people looked at me and said, John, that if you're trying to do a Bible, that'll take years. Yeah. And yeah, okay, it's, it's now been 23 years. We're in our 23rd year of translating, and we've got a Bible from Genesis to Revelation that I would put up against any other Bible on the market. But at that point in time, though, I mean, when you were making those changes, were you thinking it, it will be a translation at some point? I was, because you can't just publish a, a Bible with like, you know, 50 verses changed. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thankfully, I had some friends that did computer stuff, and so we looked through all the various versions that were out of copyright because I didn't want to start with just the Greek and the Hebrew and have to free translate from the very beginning. Mm. That would have been ridiculous. Um, We've had time now to go back and free translate whole sections of the Scripture. As we improved and improved month after month, year after year, I wanted people to have a whole Bible that they could at least read. Mm. So we looked through various versions, and we chose the American Standard Version of 1901. And there were a lot of reasons behind that. It was a very well-received version of the Scripture up until at least 1952 when the Revised Standard Version came out. And 1977, I think that's when the, the... New American Standard Bible came out in 1984, was when the first NIV came out. You know, those would have been preferable to use if I had them to start, but they were all under copyright, and by then I was already, yeah. you know. So, you mentioned Christian Education Services. Not everybody would recognize that name. Mm. Yeah, the brief explanation was we always saw ourselves as a parachurch organization, We saw ourselves as developing a following, yes, but we understood that we had information that we felt that Christian churches would really benefit from. 
And so we called ourselves Christian Educational Services. And that really worked with the exception that we kept getting calls from people that thought we were selling Sunday school materials. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So in 2006, uh, we changed the name to Spirit and Truth Fellowship International. And so we, we've been spirit and truth ever since. Okay, so that makes sense. It's the same organization, just a different name. Right. So if somebody sees something on the internet from decades ago, it's the same group. Right. Okay. So you're starting with the American Standard Version. You would then target the most egregious <laughs> translation problems first and then spread out, you know, to get to the more innocuous problems. That's exactly the process that we took. Yeah, we had a whole bunch of verses that we knew just really caused people problems and vocabulary that caused people problems. And it's like, um, we're not going to be able to fix everything at one time. Where do you want to start? Yeah. Having grown up in the church myself and having seen lots of translations and having some interlinears and learning that process, it never really phased me much to pick up a translation and have it say something that wasn't quite right, because I knew in the back of my head, well, I, I've heard this in other translations. I know there's variations, and, you know, I just do that. But when you're talking about the kids, they have none of that background. They don't understand even that one translator's small decision can change the flavor of an entire passage, and some of those passages are significant. Why is it important to be as close as possible to the original meaning, you know, and not do a paraphrase? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, and paraphrases can really add some depth if they're right. The problem with paraphrasing is that you're adding material that isn't in the text, and if you've got the wrong theology behind it, then you take the translation in a completely erroneous direction. So when we add things in the REV, we use italic type. Hmm. If a person's reading along in the Bible, they know exactly what we have added and what is in the original text. But you're exactly right about getting the translation correct. It's not just for teenagers, but it's for all non-theologians. You want to have a Bible that you can pick up and read. I mean, people read the Bible for guidance. They read the Bible for comfort. Hmm. I mean, the, the average Christian who would call themselves a Bible reader may still only read the Bible 15 or 20 minutes a day. And that would be somebody who did a lot of reading. We, we really want to have a Bible that when people do read it for guidance or comfort, it's translated in a way that they can really get it. Yeah. So, Johnny, had you read the REV before you actually met John and the Spirit and Truth team? I'm not sure. I think, really, I had, I had seen John from all of his Biblical Unitarian videos because I watched a lot of those mm-hmm. in trying to figure out, you know, what is true. Yeah. It's funny because I kind of knew him. But he obviously didn't know me. Yeah, I hadn't really heard about the REV. So that was actually one thing when I came on board. I was like, we need to figure out a way to get the REV more broadly seen. Hmm. Um, And to go off what John was saying earlier, a literal translation is not always the best. And I talk about this on Dale Tuggy's podcast just for a second. But I think our translation is really helpful in the sense that we can be paraphrasy when we feel like we need to be, but we show you because we, we put it in italics. So we'll show you, hey, this isn't actually the literal reading of the verse, but this is really what we think it says. So I think it's really the best of both worlds because the problem with a super literal translation is that at times your average reader will just completely read over it. And most people aren't going to read a verse. And if they don't understand it, go read five commentaries on it. That's very rare. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's very rare that that's going to happen. Most people are going to read a verse. If they don't understand it, they're just going to move on. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, how do we translate in such a way that people can read it the first time and for the most part, grasp what it's saying? Yeah. Let me give an example of of what John is talking about, about literal translations sometimes don't communicate. There's a verse in Kings where an older gentleman is talking to his sons or servants, and he says, tie up the donkey. Now, the average reader is going to read this and think, the donkey must be loose, and I've got to tie it up. But if you look at the the translations, including ours, the translation is, saddle the donkey, because he wanted to ride it. Mm. You and I know the saddle with, you know, the syrups and the whole getup. That wasn't invented till even after the Apostle Paul was dead. Mm. 
basically in the biblical world, you rode a donkey the same way the American Indians rode horses. You threw a blanket over the top and then you tied the blanket on and then you sat on the blanket. So, uh, frankly, I hate the translation saddle the donkey because it's so anachronistic. The saddle didn't exist yet. (laughs) Yes. But the other problem is that if you translate it literally, tie up the donkey, then everybody thinks, oh, the donkey's running around loose. (laughs) So so there are times when the Hebrew and Greeks put the translator in a real bind and you've got to make decisions. Mm. And we cover that by italics or we cover that by a footnote or we cover that in commentary. So in this case, could you say, lay a blanket over the back of the donkey and tie it down with a rope? And you're just like all in italics. <laughs> I mean, except for the word tie, yes. If, if you just said, lay a blanket over the back of the donkey and and then put the word tie in regular, <laughs> you know. And we have these discussions. Yeah. Another example is like the famous phrase in the Sermon on the Mount, when if somebody asks you to go one mile, go with them two. Yeah. That's how most translations kind of translate it. But the word there is actually talking about Roman, uh, what is it, conscription, John? What is the technical word for it? Conscription, where a Roman soldier was allowed to conscript a citizen to do work for them if they needed help lifting, carrying, whatever. Yeah, so basically, I mean, you see it with Simon of Cyrene when they force him to carry Jesus' cross. But there's no word for that in English. Like, how do you say a government forcing you to carry something for them. Like, we don't have one word to communicate that. Taxes? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, basically. Anyways, that's things like that, that you're just like, there is no one word, or we don't really have a a way to communicate that. So that's where the italics really help. And so we can add something that maybe the reader would miss originally. Yeah. To the casual reader, it's just this story about being extra helpful or doing more, but there's there's much more to it. Yeah, it's actually really interesting because, yeah, it's a negative connotation. It's not like, oh, I'm just walking with my friend for a mile. This is something you don't want to do. Somebody's forcing you to walk a mile with them. So go two with them. Like Jesus is just, yeah. he's really highlighting the heart of Christian service and humility. Yeah, that is a good example. So what is a day in the life of translating? Because there are very few people who wake up in the morning and go translate scriptures. <laughs> what is it like? Okay, well, first of all, there's a, a lot of prep work. Uh, more on the part of Jerry and Johnny and, and Bill, who translates with us out of the Hebrew, because— oh, Let's get their names in there officially. That's Okay, Jerry Werewolf, Johnny Barnes, Bill Schlegel. Okay, yeah, those that's the rest of your team. Yep. So you get up and you, you've got this section of scripture— that you're going to go through, like right now we're coming up to Matthew chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, and in the Old Testament, we're just starting in Genesis chapter 1. We just finished Lamentations about two weeks ago. And so Bill, Jerry, Johnny will look through the Greek or Hebrew, then they look through the English translations. And really, if a translation as it stands is fine, then we leave it alone. And then if it's not, then they make suggestions and say, okay, I would go this way with this verse, or I would go that way with this verse. And then depending on, you know, what we're working on, we get the team together and we read over the verse. And then usually there's some discussion like, um, hmm, not sure. (laughs) Um, And we all have access to dozens and dozens of commentaries And I would say we always look at at least 15 or 20 other translations to see how people handled this Mm. and if we have any inclination of why they've handled it this way. And then discussions about the context and the scope and what is the author really trying to say here? What's the meaning he's trying to bring forth? And a lot of times we know what the Hebrew or Greek word means in general. Most people in our world today in America are exposed to some Spanish, so they know the word casa means house, but the word casa can also mean home. Mm -hmm. And so in the context, what does house mean in English versus what does home indicate in English and what's the proper choice here? For example, if you're doing emotion type words, Greek and Hebrew both only have one word for envy and jealousy. In English, we have envy and jealousy. And they're very different. Mm -hmm. But in Greek and Hebrew, there's one word, and it can be either. Uh. So we've got to make a choice in English. So what's (laughs) the dominant thing going on here? If we feel like there's a whole lot more to be said, we may do a footnote or we may uh, 
great commentary on it. Yeah. Would you ever put envious and jealous and then put an and or in italics? I used to do that more when I did it by myself. Jerry and Johnny are much more like, no, we really need to make a choice here. Okay. You know, otherwise we end up with a, a Bible like the Amplified Bible and it becomes very, very long. There are, though, a couple places where what's being indicated by the text is so evenly divided and mm. both meanings are so important that we will put one of the two of them in italics. Oh, wow. What a fascinating process. So like you communicate together as a team every day. You work alone and together. How, what's the breakdown for like conversation time versus nose to the grindstone quiet time? John spends a lot more time in the final translation phase. So Jerry and I do legwork on our own. I spend about half my time by myself looking through the Greek and looking through commentaries, reading other translations and really thinking about verses. Um, so that's half my time. And then... The other half of my time, I'll be with John, actually translating, talking through with Jerry as well, talking through, hey, what do we think is the best way to translate this? Okay. So, but on John's end, he's spending a lot of time in the final talking through it phase because he has to do that with the Old Testament with Bill as well. Mm. He's technically ahead of the committee, the translation committee. So he's kind of there on every final say that we make. But yeah, it's a lot of input. It's not just John's opinion. There's times even when John gets outvoted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, in another place, I think that I, I really try to be sensitive and give in a lot is that, first of all, I'm 71 years old, and the vocabulary that I was raised with is not only a generation older than the vocabulary that Johnny and Jerry typically use, but also my parents were very highly educated. My father went to Harvard. My mother went to the University of Michigan. And, you know, in their discussions, um, I just picked up a more erudite vocabulary that I use day to day. <laughs> erudite? Wait, just a second. Hey, Siri, define erudite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I've brought some of that into the text because, you know, very, very tightly defined vocabulary is, to me, it's very important. And so there's loads of times when I'll ask Jerry and Johnny, and I almost always defer to them in this, you know, this is the way I would say it, but how would you guys say it? Because we don't want the Bible to go away in 20 years. I mean, it's already taken us 23 years to do it. You know, we want it to be for the next generation. We want people in their teens and their 20s and their 30s to be comfortable with this translation. Hmm. And so that's an area where I consistently defer to Jerry and Johnny. How would you guys say this? And sometimes we call an outside help for that, where we're not sure with some of the younger people. Yeah. I think two quick examples, two words that we kind of feel are outdated. We try to not to use too much anymore are lest and woe. Like, woe is me. <laughs> I mean, I understand them. I did grow up hearing the KJV a little bit. Yeah. Um, the ESV still uses words like that. But when is the last time you heard a teenager say lest? You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. So No, no. What, what is the word you would use instead of lest? We've been using otherwise a lot. Mm. We'll say otherwise, you know, this or this will happen. But there might be times when lest is really the only word that works. That, uh, I, I love the examples. This is, mm -hmm. it makes it very tangible. Like, well, yeah, because again, most people don't do this every day. And <laughs> the amount of work that goes into a particular verse. I, okay, what is the longest you've spent on, say, a particular phrase? <laughs> Well, oh, man. oh, there are times when we'll spend several hours depending on how important it is. And there are times when we'll spend a couple hours and then one or the other of us will just say, guys, I'm, I'm not seeing straight on this anymore. Uh, we need to take a break. Let's go back and study it on our own. And I would say that probably happens once every couple of weeks okay. where we just say, you know, there's three, four different ways this could be brought into English. And we're kind of at a deadlock of does it mean this or does it mean that? And so then we take a break on it and come back. Mm. Emotions are hard to translate because the Hebrew vocabulary will use the same word for so many different emotions. That's one thing. And another thing is it's hard to bring certain concepts into English from the Hebrew. So, for example, most every educated Bible person knows the thing in Proverbs that says, who can uh, value a virtuous woman, you know? Her price is above rubies. Hmm. 
back in 1611, when they made that translation, they'd never done any archaeology in Israel. Now we know that there were no rubies in the biblical world. Mm. In fact, actually, it was referring to a deep red-orange coral that washes up only occasionally on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea and so was considered very valuable. Ah. So we could translate that very accurately right now and say, you know, who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is more than coral. (laughs) 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 And it would be incredibly accurate. It would be exactly what the Hebrew is saying. The problem is that coral today isn't worth a whole lot. Mm, 99 cents, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So as translators, then we struggle. Well, if we make it literal, we have great fidelity to the text, but it communicates a totally wrong meaning. And if we say rubies, well, it brings a meaning of of value across, but it completely distorts what's in the text. You know, so there's this kind of problem that then engenders discussions that last a couple hours about what are we going to do? Yeah. That would actually, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking through that. I'm putting myself in your shoes. You're looking at the passage. You know what it actually says, and yet you want it to be communicated, and you know to do that, you have to not say what it says. And to somebody who takes Scripture so seriously, which you guys obviously do, and you've committed your life to this, that has to, at some deep level, be painful. (laughs) It is. (laughs) It it really is. And the decisions are tough. And I think in a situation like that, where we've landed is the reader getting the proper meaning is more important than us being pedantically literal to the Hebrew, and it's easy to cover in commentary. If anybody wants to actually check it, then we just simply say, you know, the Hebrew word is so-and-so, and and it means coral, which in the ancient world was very rare and very expensive. Okay. A great example, too, in the New Testament is pearls. At the time the New Testament was written, the pearl was known as the apex gem. There was no gem that was more expensive than a pearl. Mm. Well, in the 1900s, when the Japanese learned how to make cultured pearls, and all of a sudden every woman and her sister has a necklace of cultured pearls, the pearl just plummeted in value. Mm. We still translated pearls because I think most people know that a, an actual natural pearl is still very valuable. So we still leave pearls in the New Testament. But we cover in commentary about the value of pearls in the first century, and why Christ would use the pearl of great price as an illustration for a man who's willing to sell everything to get this one pearl. Well, you put a lot of commentary on your translation. So let's talk about the structure of the REV and how you've configured it. The commentary is kind of a cross between what we call a critical commentary, giving you the Hebrew or Greek word and the meanings of the Greek words so that you can see the range of meanings that are available for the translator to choose. But also, it's more like a study Bible in the sense that it also has commentary on what you're supposed to do with the verse in the sense of this is how this is supposed to guide your life or affect your life. And in a truly academic, critical commentary, like you won't ever find that kind of thing. That's more like a study Bible note. Mm. Of course, I've been writing commentary for almost 23 years, so it shouldn't be surprising. We've now got commentary on about 13,000 verses, and there's over 32,000 verses in the Bible, so the good news is our work isn't going away for a while. (laughs) (laughs) I expect a commentary on every verse, so— Get busy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, the more you work with teenagers and the more you work with uh, non-theologians— you realize how much they really don't understand. Hmm. You know, so some of the stuff that we write, I would think, well, just from reading the Bible, we know what this means. But then there was a period where we were homeschooling my teenage grandson, and we started in Proverbs because that's the only book of the Bible that's specifically addressed to youth. And we'd read a proverb, and I'd be like, oh, well, he certainly will know what this means. And I'd say, okay, so Colton, what does this verse mean? He's like, "Uh, I'm not really sure. (laughs) And and you realize that people really need help with the understanding of some of these verses. Now, some of them are genuinely difficult, and everybody needs help. Yeah. You know, one of the things that makes our translation unique is that we're not afraid to go against the grain. So there's times when if every single version translates a verse a certain way, but we feel really, really sure 
that they got it wrong, we will translate it in a different way. You know, I think a lot of the major translations have a lot of external pressures mm. to live up to and please certain people and not kind of ruffle <laughs> any feathers. Yeah. So we have that luxury where we it's okay to ruffle a few feathers. Like we already we know we're gonna ruffle a few feathers. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, you've crossed that bridge already. You're yeah. Yeah. And again, we we are very cautious. So like if unless we're just really, really sure, we're not gonna go against, you know, ninety nine percent of translations. But there are times. You know, if I could add to that too, Johnny, I really appreciate you bringing that up because this was something that I became aware of through my textual research that 1952, the Revised Standard Version, was the first well-known or widely published English version that relied uh, in part on Ugaritic, which is a cognate language to Hebrew, which was only deciphered in the 30s and then got peer-reviewed in the 40s. And so then it influenced and helped us understand some difficult verses, particularly you know in the Old Testament that hadn't ever made any sense before. And so the 1952 Revised Standard Version came out and there were some changes. And the evangelical world completely rebelled against particularly one of those, called it the Reverse Standard Perversion, and it was not accepted in evangelical churches. And the publishing world learned a great lesson from that, a sad lesson, but they learned a big lesson. And what the lesson was that if your Bible doesn't read the way your parents' Bible read, then you're upset about it and you'll reject it. And so finally, Christianity Today came out with an article uh, last year. I even saved the magazine because it was the first time I'd ever actually seen this in writing, that you get a translating committee together, you put a translation of the Bible together, but the last eyes on it are the marketing committee. And if they see something that they know this won't sell, I mean, you've just probably spent close to millions of dollars hiring translators, setting up editing committees, an average of eight to 10 years to do a translation. And so the marketing committee will say, look, I know that scholastically it doesn't read this way, but if nobody's going to read your Bible, it doesn't matter. So we might as well do this. So what people don't realize is that there are certain passages that are translated the way they are to make certain people happy. And we are not under that pressure. I'm trying to make God happy. I mean, (laughs) all of us on the translating team, we all want to do the best job we can with with perfect fidelity to bring the meaning of the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic into English. And if somebody comes to me and says, well, I don't like your translation of so-and-so, and and I'm not going to read your Bible, it's like, well, I'm sad for you, but the fact of the matter is the Bible's free. (laughs) You know, it's on the internet. And if you don't want to read it, Go find a Bible that you're happy reading. So who's on your marketing committee who gives the final okay after you're done? (laughs) Surely you have one. Come on. (laughs) No, no, I think it's pretty much the four of us. Although I will say, and and I love this, as the REV is gaining traction, we have a whole raft of people that now are feeling uh, very comfortable chiming in and saying, have you considered doing this with this verse or doing this with this verse? Mm. And that's fabulous because it's the equivalent of a peer review. If you're a doctor or scientist and you write an article, that's one thing. If you write an article and then it's peer reviewed and then it's published, yeah, that always is stronger. And basically people reading our translation are our peer review system. So how frequently do you get feedback from readers about how you translated something? I would say a couple times a month. Okay. Yep. And just because I'm curious, how often does an input from somebody outside actually take you back to the passage as a team and and work through it again? It happened just this week with, I can't remember exactly, somebody suggested. That's right. We sure did. um, Yep. I can't remember, I can't it remember what it was either. <laughs> it was in <laughs> Romans. But yeah, so um, it, it happens. And I mean, people need to know that. People need to be aware that, mm. you know, we don't sign off on it. You know, okay, this session is done and this is God breathed. You know, it's, you know, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're yeah. always open to, is there something we have not seen from the scope or the context or a meaning of a word that kind of escapes us? Well, that takes me to the, to the nature the physical nature of what you have. You have a Bible translation that's always being adjusted in one area or another. You're updating things. You're maybe going back to places that you had worked on years ago Mm -hmm. and making some adjustments. Is it ever really going to be done? (laughs) And if not, does that mean we'll never get it in a leather-bound book? Well, in one sense, we are working very hard to get it to that. The New Testament's probably five years away. And the, the Old Testament is probably 
10 years away. Okay. Now, realistically, it's just like, for example, there's been now, what, three New American Standard Bibles. The original one came out in 77. And then there was a 2009, Johnny, that the, the second New American Standard Bible came out. And then 2020. 2020. In 2020, the third one came out. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, we did not really explain how exactly the process works. So right now, as John mentioned, when they first did the REV, they went through problem verses. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't go through problem verses. We go through each verse at a time. So right now, I'm working through Romans and Matthew, and we'll go through verse by verse. So I'll spend a week or two translating Romans 5, and then we'll get together as a group of three and translate Romans 5 together. We are going verse by verse. We're not just taking problem passages. Okay. So when we say we'll be done in five years, we mean we will be finished going verse by verse through the entire New Testament. Okay, five years is the target for having had every verse given a consideration. Completely and... retranslated, yeah. Okay, okay. And it's not that we haven't read every verse. You know, We've read through every verse in the New Testament and made sure that it's not just a, a complete problem or teaching something wrong. Mm -hmm. But this is a complete verse-by-verse -verse translation. All right, so 10 years to get the fully bound REV. Yes, and I want, I'm <laughs> longing for that. I, I love reading a hardcover Bible. All right. so. Will you have a marketing committee finally by then? <laughs> can I be honest? Yes, just for the looks, just for the looks. Okay, okay. You can choose the leather, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So how do people get a hold of this now? First of all, the, the straightforward way is the website, which is revisedenglishversion.com. Okay. You just type in your browser, revisedenglishversion.com, and pow, you're right there. And then there's a little introductory video that we want to redo that shows you how to use some things because it's actually a very powerful tool. Like it has a search function. It has a topics button. Uh, it has appendices. If you don't like the Meriwether type font that normally comes up, we have six or seven type fonts you can change. Hmm. Some people like Jerry like the writing in white and the background in black instead of the normal, you know, black yeah, on white. Jerry would like it that way. <laughs> if you have older eyes like I do, you can change the size of the font. Yeah. Looking at it on a computer, you can change the number of columns. So it's actually mm. a very powerful tool. So you can go to revisedenglishversion.com or it has its own app, which is also the revised English version. Okay. And you can get that from the app store or you can get it as part of our normal uh, app. We have just a spirit and truth fellowship app for your Bible that has access to videos and our blog and and that type of thing. Are those on both platforms, like Apple and... Uh... Yes, they are. All right. And then the fourth way is you can go right to our Spirit and Truth website, which is uh, spiritandtruthonline.org, and you can okay. go right to the website and get to the REV through there. So uh, four distinct and, and easy-to-use ways to get to the REV. I heard somebody mention that something was actually published physically. Yes, in 2013, I handed in the New Testament that we had at the time. Okay. If I remember correctly, it came out in April of 2014. Hmm. At this point, now with Johnny and Jerry both translating and us really working hard on the whole New Testament, things have changed so dramatically that I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. I, I did notice that that the names of the people who worked on the translations aren't listed. I, I'm curious why that is. Um, Periodically, people say, why don't you make it available for us to know who your translators are? Like, you know, you look up any other Bible and they'll say, you know, these are the translators or these are the denominations. And the reason that we don't do that is that in the 23 years, a lot of people that have helped us did not want to be affiliated with us formally. They didn't want their name to be known. Like one guy I know hmm. who had his degree in Greek from the University of Greensboro was going to a denominational church with his wife and kids. And his knowledge of Greek was superb. And he is a biblical Unitarian, but flying under the radar. Through the 23 years, some people have changed their affiliations. So the answer I give everybody is just, if the translation is good, it'll stand on its own. It's not about the people who translated it. Mm. Yeah, it helps from committing the logical fallacy of just thinking, you know, whoever's name it is makes it true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, if if this person said it, then it must be true. That's a logical fallacy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it does help prevent against that. 
Mm. You know, we're not saying our, our stuff is true because of whose name is behind it, but because of who, who spoke it originally, God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. yes. So you're doing two things as you work through this. You are correcting or improving, clarifying translations, and writing commentary. So like, Johnny, you're, are you just doing translations or are you also getting to do some commentary? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing both as well. Yeah. So basically, if there's a verse that we translate and we're like, man, we really need to add some commentary on this. Like this is, you know, this is tough. <laughs> Probably the next day I'll spend, you know, an hour or so and, and write commentary on that verse and, you know, explain why we translated it the way we did. And mm. again, that's another really cool, unique thing that really only the NET is the only other translation that gives you translation notes. Mm. So I think it's really cool that you know, we're explaining to you why we translated it in a lot of, you know, more controversial places. Yeah. So we, we kind of share the load. And and that's an area too where people have given us like, uh, I remember writing the initial commentary on John 8, 58, and somebody wrote in and said, well, you know, what you've got is nice, but I had these other questions. Mm. And so then we go back and we expand the commentary to make sure that it's inclusive enough that people are actually getting their questions answered. Mm. And so I'm consistently modifying commentary <laughs> that's been there for a while. So even if you do get a leather-bound Bible within about a month after it releases, <laughs> your commentary will already be updated yeah. and somebody will need to go back to the online version. <laughs> well, if, if you were to print the entire REV Bible just on your home printer, yeah, which we used to do fairly regularly just to have a hard copy. I could do the whole thing in about 408 pages. Okay. The commentary at this point would be well over 1,200 pages to print. Oh, man. Because it's well, thir commentary on 13,000 verses. So um, oh. for the most part, if you want the instant access to the commentary, even if you had a hard copy Bible, you'd want to have your phone or a tablet handy that, you know, you could just say, oh, what's this verse mean? And then you check the commentary on your phone and then, yeah. then go back to reading your hard copy. <laughs> wow. Oh, and that's something I should say too, by the way. If somebody yeah. says, I just can't do the electronic thing, I've got to do hard copy. The entire REV or any chapter of the REV or any book of the REV can be downloaded in e either as a PDF or Microsoft Word and printed. Hmm. So if you're sitting there going, gosh, I'd just like to study Ephesians, but I'd really like it in hard copy, then make a choice. Do you want it in Word? Do you want it in PDF? And if you want it in Word, what font do you want to use? What size font do you want to use? Punch the button and poof, it's in a Word document. Print it off and put it in a three-ring binder. Cool. So that's right on the web page. You're looking at Ephesians. You can yep. select that option right there. Right there. Yep. Oh, that's good. If you do want the entire Bible, you just go to Settings, and in the Download section, you just push download. You can download the entire Bible. Done. Okay. And where do we send the check when we download it for copyrights? <laughs> <laughs> to our marketing team. Well, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> actually, believe it or not, we just got a donation yesterday for the REV fund. So, oh. um, so people do that. Fantastic. Well, guys, this has been a joy. I love what you're doing. I love that you love what you're doing. That, you know, you're just Bible nerdy enough to commit your life to writing out and dealing with like obscure language things for the purpose of benefiting others. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Appreciate your letting us on, Mark. This is a, a blessing to get to do this podcast with you. So I joked about it, but, but the idea that marketing people would have any influence on a translation is quite disturbing. Let that remind us that translations are products of human effort, and they should not be elevated too high, like to the point of obscuring the God and his Messiah detailed therein. We've officially announced our plans for regional UCA conferences. Regional UCA conferences will be organized and hosted by a local group or church. You may be a part of a group who would consider this. You don't have to have your own building. These can take place in other venues. So if this interests you, here are the two primary goals. First, to introduce and promote your group and its ministry to a wider audience. And second, to allow UCA members within your region to gather and connect with an experience similar to the main UCA conference. A UCA conference by design is not a denominational event. 
It's an opportunity to connect with people from various backgrounds and practices and to advance the truth of the simple monotheism of our Lord Jesus. There's more info in the recent blog post, which I linked in the show notes, including what the UCA will do to help promote and support you and your group, the hosts. Go to UnitarianChristianAlliance.org to learn more. And a reminder that I send out a newsletter with each episode. I tell you a bit more about it, like some behind-the-scenes details or additional impressions that I don't share elsewhere. There's a link to sign up in the show notes or the podcast webpage, podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org. Something that I've really enjoyed over the last several months is emailing each new UCA member. I'm using the contact form within their profile on the UCA website. I introduce them to what we're up to, the events, the resources, YouTube channel, and naturally I point them to this podcast. You, in fact, might be one of those new members who started listening after you got my note. (laughs) Welcome. I appreciate you being part of this effort. Ours may be just one narrowly focused effort, but it's making a difference. If you are new and you want to reach out, please do. Email me and say hi, podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. And speaking of emails, into the mailbag we go. Cindy G. wrote a short note on episode 69, He Gets Us Because He's One of Us Roundtable. Cindy wrote, This was so informative. I am so thankful you have a platform to share the truth. We need to make Christ known in the midst of the flood of misunderstanding in our day and time and let people know who our Lord really is. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. I couldn't agree more. Carrie Weinholz also wrote about the roundtable. Love the relaxed honesty. Yes, being Unitarian wasn't even in our Bible school options of heresies. So I would challenge everyone to seriously consider simply taking the Bible at face value, especially what God and Jesus said there. Then check out what the disciples preached and wrote. Thanks, Carrie. If we keep at this, eventually we'll be a part of the curriculum in the Bible colleges and seminaries around the world. And yes, reading it at face value is the best way to do it. Essential and salvational beliefs will be the ones found using face value, and not through multi-step implication chains. Wait, what's the sound of a four- or five-step implication chain? Mm, ah, Oh, well. Finally, here's an informative note from Tim Anderson from Virginia. I had the pleasure of meeting Tim in person at the 2022 UCA conference. He wrote me regarding episode 68, Pictures and Missions, in which I spoke with Christadelphian Levi Jeleno. Hi, Mark. I've enjoyed getting to know everyone and having the conference be in a format of learning and discussion with people of like beliefs outside of our own individual worship practices. The reason the name Christadelphian was coined was at the insistence of the U.S. government. In a nutshell, during the Civil War, this group of Bible students did not want to join their North-South military units and be required to kill their brethren, or anyone for that matter, contrary to our Lord's command to love your enemy and bless those that curse you, Matthew 5.21 and 5.44. Dr. John Thomas and others working together appealed to the government in Washington for conscientious objection status for religious beliefs to not be required to bear arms. And so it was granted on condition of having a denominational name to identify this group of Bible students with the government. This name selection was imposed upon them, seeing as they did not want to have such. So here we are today, one of the few denominations our United States government approves of having conscientious objection status, in not bearing arms, but allowing non-military service in civilian government work. And I thought this might be helpful. My grandfather was put in prison during World War I as a conscientious objector in Canada. Here's the Christadelphian magazine, Tidings, where he's mentioned on page 40. His name was Arthur Hill. (laughs) Wow, thanks, Tim. I've put a link to that issue of Tidings in the show notes. What you say fits Levi's description of the exceptionally decentralized and non-hierarchical nature of the Christadelphians. 
it's no surprise that naming it as a denomination was not of their own doing. There's a lot of historical information about this and other groups who, in the last few hundred years, were able to pull back from the grip of Catholic tradition and appreciate the simpler teachings of Jesus and the apostles. There are historical accounts that have been written from within groups, telling that group's history. But as far as I know, there isn't a higher-level account of the spread of Unitarian understanding through the world in the modern era. I've begun talking with one of my historian friends about this. I'm not sure where it will lead, but at the least, I'd love to be able to have a more robust list of these groups. If this is something that you are interested in, reach out to me at podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org and we can talk about it. Wouldn't the modern spread of Unitarian groups be a great topic for a future UCA paper? I think so. The request for papers is on. Deadline is August 1st. We recently posted about it on unitarianchristianalliance.org and I put a link to that post in the notes. Technically, I put a link to all the things I reference, or that the guests reference, in the notes. I try to be very deliberate about that. This podcast exists to serve you, and when you are listening in the car, you can't write things down. So I do it for you, and you can get it later. Oh, and one more note from the mailbag. Chris Castellanos writes, Hello and greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking to purchase a Bible translation that is translated correctly without the Trinitarian bias. I have been studying the KJV mostly. If not the KJV, which translation do you recommend? Thank you for your time and God bless you. So, Chris, as I mentioned in my email response, this episode is the one I was working on. The REV is an excellent resource and, from what I can tell, they don't have a Trinitarian marketing department looking over their shoulders. As for the other translations, well, I see this question pop up fairly often. There are a lot of thoughts on this, and to be honest, I'm not equipped to give a rundown of all the options. But you know what I would love? Help from the UCA people. I'd love to find an article or blog post out there which deals with this question objectively and informatively. If you know of a well-done listing of the translations and their advantages, disadvantages, and their Trinitarian biases, let me know. I'd love to use it as a resource for others who are looking into this very question. And I'll mention it here. Thanks for writing, Chris. So, if you found the Trinitarian bias in your Bible's translation to be off-putting, and you appreciate the Herculean effort that Spirit and Truth have put into the REV, maybe share this episode with your fellow non-Trinitarians. They may not even know this translation exists, and I'm pretty sure meeting some of the people behind it will be a delight. Thank you, John and Johnny, for an excellent, informative, and fun interview. I look forward to talking again. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.